Hi, my name is Elizabeth Bowman, and this is the Opera Glasses Podcast. Today, I have an old friend on the show, soprano Joyce Elkuri. We met when we were both at the University of Ottawa. Joyce then went on to study at the Academy of Vocal Arts in Philadelphia, then the Metropolitan Opera's Lindemann Young Artist Program. She has sung on many of the world's greatest stages, including the Royal Opera House in London, the Metropolitan Opera, the Canadian Opera Company, and most recently she was performing with Opéra de Montréal. Um, I'm so pleased that she's here. She was born in Lebanon, raised in Canada, so she's Lebanese-Canadian. Uh, she has a lot of wonderful things to say, so let's let's get to it. Joyce Elcori, welcome to the Opera Glasses podcast. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So great to have you here. Obviously, we have a history together. We've known each other for many, many years. Don't say the number. Okay. <laughs> Um, but it's great to have a sort of an official conversation and record it because you know oftentimes our work together has been sort of silent and um, behind the scenes yeah and whenever we're together we we never manage to get pictures together so this is (laughs) well we still have just what what one photo from 2013 or something yeah that's all we have very sad (laughs) oh all right, so you were just in Montreal uh, mm-hmm. doing doing Butterfly and uh, really wonderful things I've heard about that. Um, how was the experience? It, it was great. I mean, it, it was this was my second production of Butterfly and um, it was just such, honestly, it was so, so great. It was such a joy to work with that team. The Opéra de Montréal is the really f- familial ambiance. We, we had a great time and the audience, we had five performances and that, seat, that theater has, I think, almost 2,900 seats. I think a bit more. Um, and it was full every night. Wow. And so it's very heartening, actually, for opera. Yeah, <laughs> de Montréal seems to be doing like amazing things in our spring issue. Actually, we we just highlighted all their sort of transformation programs where they're going out into the community and trying to help with mental health issues and and all that uh, amazing stuff. So uh, yeah, great company, great company, great company. Yeah, excellent, excellent work they're doing artistically and otherwise. Really great. Um, so I really wanted you to come on to the podcast because you have uh, your next opera is, I guess, somewhat unexpected, but not really unexpected to me. So um, why don't you tell us about it? Yeah. <laughs> so Carmen, taking on the role of Carmen, I'm doing it in St. Margarete and an Opa im Steinburg. And it's, they, they do opera in this outdoor quarry. It's just such an incredible setting. And it's a new production. And by Arnaud Bernard, who I've worked with before. We worked, we did Traviata together in, uh, in Korea, in Seoul. And I think, yes. And um, I always knew that I would sing Carmen. I, it was just a matter of when and how. And Ottawa U days... Right. I so, uh, did you sing in that production? I didn't sing in that one, but I saw okay. it. Okay. So, th- I was so new to opera, and this was really my first immersion into opera. And so, here we are, Ottawa U Music Program in the opera workshop class that we held Wednesdays, seven to ten p.m. That's when we rehearsed. We prepared Carmen. And everybody had different scenes. I had to say, I, I had to sing the Habanera and the Car Trio. And I was so just, it's just the world of Carmen just, you know, g- grabbed me and in the most real way. And I fell in love with opera. And it, up until that point, I wasn't sure I wanted to do opera. So... Carmen has been working through my psyche this whole time from all those years, right? Mentally, emotionally. And I've been in the chorus. I was in the chorus at Santa Fe Opera as a young artist. I sung Michaela in two productions. I sung Frasquita at the Met. I mean, there's just, I have a lot of history. And so, and my voice has always been in a, been unusual in color. And so 
for a while, people thought I was a mezzo. Um, and my middle lower voice has always been there. I think it's the Mediterranean in me, honestly. We have this, oh, we tend to have low chesty voices. I mean, listen to how I speak. So it's kind of, I'm rambling, but it's, it, it it's, the offer came and it was just kind of a no brainer for me. This is, yes, this is, this is the right time. I'm, I'm ready to do it. I know her, you know? Yeah. 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 I wish I wish I could be there to see it, um, to see it live. I think it's so funny how how sort of shocking it is when a soprano takes a traditionally mezzo soprano role, or you know, someone who wouldn't normally do it takes it, and people are so vocal about it. I I just I think it's interesting because I mean sometimes it just works with your voice, and it does. It's not necessarily I mean, it's the same with anything. Like we are all human and we are all different and we don't yeah. necessarily fit into a box. Right. Yeah. No, no, exactly. It's just this system that we've put ourselves in where there are all these vocal fox, vocal categories, and you have to pick one and stay in your lane. And there's something to be said about that for young singers and for uh, vocal health and making sure that you're serving the public in a way, you know, that is worthy. But at the same time, we are organic humans. <laughs> We're organic instruments and it's, you can't put it in a box. And if you do, it's one, it's boring and be, it can be, uh, can be a bit, a bit dangerous. If you just say, I only sing this repertoire and you don't vary for me, I think Carmen is about the personality, the character and the color of the voice. Of course. Not and so much the, the. If you have the range to sing it, I mean, if you don't have the range to sing it, don't sing it. But if you have the range to sing it and the color that you think that the color that can bring it, bring all the, 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 the passion that is, that is there and all the, the, uh, the like hot blooded temperament, if, if you have it, then, you know, why not? And that's my, that's why I've decided to go for it. Yeah. That makes sense. Great. Are they going to get it on video? Do you know? Yes. Or? Yeah, it will be filmed, um, telecast, and uh, DVD. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, uh, we'll be sure to share all that information. Um, Thank you on the Opera Canada pages, uh, so that everyone can can check out this this exciting ex performance. This conversation about Fach also reminds me of something in our spring issue because there is an article on the Fox system. Sorry to plug the spring issue continuously right now, but <laughs> plug away. We're talking about a lot of things that sort of pertain to it. So um, yeah. there's a very interesting article by Patricia Yates in there with a fun title that I gave it. <laughs> I read it, I enjoyed that article. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a really interesting questions posed in there and an important discussion to be, to be having. We, I mean, I think we always have to kind of look, look toward, okay, what are we doing? What's working? What's not? Yeah. You know? And I think that as artists, we need to know who we are. Once we identify that, then, and I'm categorizing myself as an artist, even though I'm here as editor in chief, I'm not, I'm not that. Um, but I understand the psyche I'm married to one. Well, and you've worked with so many, you work with so many all the time, you know, yeah. and you yeah. are an artist, actually you are. But once you know who you are, you, you're able to, to project whatever that is. And if it doesn't fit into our norm, that's okay. As long as it's organically you, like you say about Carmen being organically you. Yeah. And that's why you're ready. That's because yeah. you know who you are. And <laughs> Yeah, the audience feel, they feel that. Yeah, oh no, absolutely. the The audience, whether they're aware of it or not, they they get a sense of who we are um, from their seats. We can't hide. Absolutely. We can't hide behind art. We can't hide behind opera. We just you can't. And and I think the thing about me is is this. I didn't. This isn't a decision that I made lightly, right? I mean, when the offer came, I said yes because it's something I've been thinking about forever. But I will say, and you know me, I'm very serious. I take my work very seriously and I've dedicated, literally dedicated my life to this art form. So I have the most, the utmost respect and love for it. I've dedicated my entire existence to it. So taking on a role, whether it's Carmen 
or Norma, which is coming up as well, you know, I don't make decisions lightly. I don't take a role that I don't think I'll do well in, that I don't think, you know, if, if I don't think I can serve the role, serve the music in the best way, I just will not do it. I mean, I have had some offers that are a little bit out there, um, you know, for a rep that I wouldn't touch for another 10 years, right? And I say no. So uh, I made this decision very soberly and very aware of the challenges that might come. But I know I might not be everybody's cup of tea in the theater. They might say, oh, yeah, I really love her. Oh, God, oh, I don't like her, you know, and that's out of my control with any role that I do. But I know that I have something that I want to say with Carmen. I have a, I have a very, very specific way that I want to play her. And that's what I'm excited to do. Uh, you have an interesting career because um, you've done a lot of role creations or role rediscoveries or things that people have never heard before, um, things that people haven't necessarily put a stamp on yet. Tell me a bit about that, the sort of taking a score that has no recordings and sort of creating that character, because I, I find that part very fascinating. Yeah, it is fascinating. And, and it's been like you say, a big part of my career, really surprisingly so. You know, when you're a young artist starting out, you don't imagine these things, right? Um, so uh, it's been really great to go down this this avenue. And what I've learned is that not having previous recordings, or many, right? Um, not having a long history of tradition and uh, with a certain opera, it's very freeing then. Because you sing it and you sing the way you want to authentically sing it, hopefully. <laughs> it's also a challenge because you have a, you have sort of a, somewhat of a blank canvas. And, and then what you do is what will be in people's ear. And it has to be good. <laughs> and it has to be representative of the work. I mean, the work hasn't had up until now the opportunity to be, to see the light of day and to be showcased and to be in people's ears that it's a huge responsibility then to say listen to this listen how to how beautiful this is it's a big responsibility just to say for the listeners who may not know the exact productions that we're talking about here um, you did a lot of work with opera rara in london um, specifically donizetti's lounge de necessita you sang the title role of, in that Antonina in Belisario by Donizetti, and Le Martyr also by Donizetti, uh, the role of Pauline. And also you brought to life Mira in Franz Liszt's opera, Sardinapolo, uh, with the Weimar Staatskapelle on the Audite label. So that's a, that's a lot of, of, of roles, and everyone listening should go and check them out on any, any streaming platform. I mean, the music is, is incredible. Every, every one of those recordings has something that is just shocking, you know, to hear. And then you think, well, why don't we do these pieces anymore? That's a discussion for a whole other time. But So on the topic of all these roles that you've done and Carmen that's coming up, can you tell us a bit about what is coming up as well for you? Yes. So in the official soprano repertoire... <laughs> Um, I will be singing my first Norma this summer in Athens. And uh, let's see, <clears throat> role debuts, role debuts. I'm singing Elisabetta and Don Carlo in the fall, but I can't tell you where yet. And Amelia in Simone Boccanegra in Helsinki, which I'm super excited about. Uh, I mean, I'm excited about them all, but Amelia is another role that I've been studying most of my life. So I'm really excited about that. I'm going back to Montreal, actually, to do an, a new opera called La Reine Garçon about Christina, Queen of Sweden. So that's happening in February in Montreal. It's just going to be freezing cold and we'll survive. Um, yes, but you know, I'm not the kind that's going to sit in the snow and make uh, snowmen. Um, so uh, yeah, these are, those are just a few. So I have, uh, I think I have six, six new roles this in the next several months. So, um, I have a lot of work to do and I'm actually really fortunate to be able to, 
to be able to do it. It's, um, yeah, it's an exciting time. Finally out of the pandemic, right? <laughs> I mean, it's, we don't, we don't have to go there. That's, no, that's, no. Let's, let's skip that part. Yeah. Um, have you ever been to Greece, by the way? Never. Africa? I've never been to Greece. I'm, I'm, I'm so excited. I'm, I'm hoping that I can squeeze in a little holiday at least three days. I think that's all I can do right after. Um, because, uh, yeah. But ha have you been? I've been many times because I used to work with this chamber festival there that sort of oh, went right. around to the various sort of islands. Yeah. yeah. It's on, okay. It's okay. Chamber music festival. It's still there and okay. um, it has a lot of really wonderful musicians that go there. I, I'm pretty sure they're they're uh, doing it this summer, but I I think they do they're doing it at the end of August now. It's a different oh. kind of dates. What's the name of the festival again? The Saronic Chamber Music Festival. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Yeah. And they go to um, one of my favorite islands, uh, Hydra, which is where Leonard Cohen had a house. Uh-huh. <laughs> you can see why. Okay. Yeah, I, guess, yeah, I can see why. <laughs> yeah, it's a truly special place. And I, yeah, you you should definitely travel. I'm okay. Yeah. Really I If I have time. I don't know if I will. I don't think I will, yeah. but you sound quite busy. It's busy, yeah. Yeah. But it's good for your soul. So what? Work or rest? No, it's going to a Greek island is good for your soul. Yeah, well, yes, exactly. So I will try to do it. I will. I will need it. I will need it. Tell me about your off stage life. Like obviously you're working really hard, but you also have you have interest in other in other things beyond that sort of complement your work uh, on stage. Tell me about that. Two main things I would say take up a lot of my time other than work. Um, and they are kind of work as well, but in a different way. I'm doing a lot of work with Lebanon, helping students, students of singing there to give them education, to mentor them, to connect them with people from the industry so that they can start to build bridges for those of them that want to have careers. So that takes up a lot of my time. I work with them individually. I work with them in masterclasses. I've gone to Lebanon a few times now to teach for several days at a time. And it's all, I, it's all just done on my, my own time. And it's because I want to do it and because I love it and because I think they need it and they deserve it. And I had the opportunity to build my life and I just want to be able to try to help them have the same opportunities. That takes up a lot of my time. Um, that and and working on, on Arabic music, which we are about to record in the next few weeks. T tell me about this we and what, what this means. Recording. We. So the we. The we is me <laughs> and my friend and a musical partner, Sirush Karajan. He was, um, for those of you who don't know him, he's a pianist, composer, arranger, music extraordinaire, just a, a genius creative mind. I mean, here's a musician that can improvise just on a whim and come up with gold. He was born in Lebanon. And um, so he's Lebanese Armenian and he understands, he knows the culture. I mean, he didn't leave Lebanon until he was 12. Yes. Um, and so we have a similar love for Lebanon and similar passion for, for the culture. And my goal with this album is to, is to introduce people who might not otherwise know the songs that are, you know, that are known, that are just, um, you know, that, that we consider our songs, Lebanese songs, right. And, and to introduce people to the Lebanese culture in general, because, um, when <laughs> when people think of Lebanon and Beirut, they think disaster, chaos. Did I ever tell you the story of when I was singing Traviata and we were making crepes in France? No. Okay, I'm going to tell you the story. I was singing a show in France and my friend, who was part of the administration, said, I'm going to come over and I'm going to make you crepe. You know, we're going to have crepes. You're going to love it. It's going to be a nice dinner. I said, great, welcome, come. 
I love carbs. And so, so he came and he made the crepe and the crepes, he, he had like a flour of like a, all over my kitchen, like all over this, the, the counters on the roof, on the, the roof, on the walls, like just, it was just disaster zone. Right. And then another colleague joins us an hour later and he walks in and he looks around and he says, Oh mon Dieu, c'est Beirut. And that was the first time I had ever heard somebody say, wow, it's Beirut to describe a mess or a chaos or a disaster or, you know, and I thought, oh my God, this is, this is our reputation because our country has been through so much, so much trauma. And of course, what is the news going to show you all that stuff, you know, so the average person doesn't know about the poetry and the music and the landscape and the, 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 the fashion and the food and the hospitality, which is, which permeates the culture. Like you, like you would not, but they would literally give you the shirt off their back. They give you their shoes if you needed them. Right. So I want to, that's my biggest passion right now, other than opera is promoting Lebanese culture. And, um, there will be an announcement on this soon in terms of an officialness to this kind of thing, uh, promoting Lebanese culture. So um, that's, yeah, this is huge for me at the moment. Huge, huge, huge. Any well, questions? <laughs> I'm really excited to hear this when it's all um, said and done. And Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we will be recording uh, a full album with um, chamber music, chamber musicians. Lebanese songs that are you know, belong to our culture, that are representative of the country, and uh, it's going to be sung in my way, right? So it's I'm not going to be I I I will not pretend to be an Arabic singer. It's not how I was trained. I mean, yes, I speak Arabic, but um, it's a completely different s uh, style of singing. But I will be singing it in my classically trained Joyce way. <laughs> And so bridging a little bit of the the two genres. Well, it sounds like a really interesting project and I'm I'm really looking forward to to hearing it and also to sharing um all the all the behind the scenes stuff. If it, oh, thank you. You'll, you'll let thank us. you. Thank you. Thank you. So excited about it. Um since you're so established now and you know you're you're into your career, I'm just wondering what kind of advice you would have for for young singers. You know, looking back on the last 12 years of career, I would say that, and this isn't going to be a surprise. This isn't like, whoa, breaking news, but a technique, you know, and it's, it, your technique is what will see you through your whole career and it will continue to evolve and it will continue to change because your voice is your instrument physical will change right as you age as you go through life as you ex experience emotions it affects us right looking back i mean when i first for example when i first made those recordings 2012 was the first one that was right out of the gate i was just starting out then I, I was a completely different singer Compl and my technique for that time for that instrument was solid. I knew what to do with my voice. Right. But looking back now, I sound completely different. My voice has evolved. My technique has evolved. Right. So staying meticulous in the day to day, just the, 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 the daily laborious, boring work of technique is so important because otherwise, if you don't see to your instrument, you will wake up one day, chances are, and you won't recognize your voice and you'll be in trouble. And I've seen that happen a lot. Sorry, not, I don't mean to cast, you know, doom and gloom, but this is, it's, this is real. This is a real thing in, in the industry because you get, you get booked, you get busy, you get busy, you work, you work, you work. And then where do you have time to rest your voice? Number one. Where do you have time to see your teacher and do your coachings if you're always in rehearsal going from gig to gig? So it's important to keep that in mind that you keep a steady diet of vocal health 
behavior. Okay, yeah. that's number one. Can I go on to number two? Yes. Okay. Here's another thing that I'm seeing now. Young singers in schools still getting their education, still learning about who they are and who they want to be as artists. Their relationship with social media, I think, is I've seen some people fall into the trap of putting the cart before the horse. So they will put content out there before they're ready, while they're still developing their voices and developing their artistry. And I think that's risky. And I, I'm saying this on this forum because you've asked, but I say this directly to singers one-on-one -on -one because I say, until you're really ready, think very carefully about what you put out there because first impressions last forever. It's also incredibly distracting for these young musicians, like not just singers, right. but instrumentalist and anyone right. that requires this um i mean classical music in general requires a, a lot of patience and time like you're saying this this incremental um and continuous consistent work that needs to be done for the technique um but if you're distracted all the time and you're you're living a life in very short bursts of focus I mean, obviously it sort of ties yeah. your number one and number two, but this is a real problem. Yeah. 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 And also I'll take it a step further and say, not only is it distracting, but also it's when you, when you put the focus on social media and getting followers, and I understand this is the society we're in, I get it. Right. If we want to work, if we want to play in this game, we have to play in the game, right? But I get a sense that people are after followers and content and success and popularity, not success, everybody's after success, but popularity and focusing on creating that result than really working on the product in this case, which is the voice, the artistry. Right. So it's, that's what I mean by putting the cart before the horse. It's like, okay, what's more important here is what's the career about? Is it about the art or is it about the popularity? And it's, it takes a long time for a career to, it's been my experience to build, to gain momentum for the voice to settle, especially a voice like mine, which has been unusual from the beginning, right? An artist needs time. That's not to say that you're not ready at a young age, of course, you can be. But it all needs to, I think, be taken into, you know, really examine the 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 the, the root, if that makes sense. Yep. Number three is this professional artistic relationships must be nurtured. Okay. And it's very important for a young singer a young artist, a young musician to forge their own way and create their own opportunities. You it's yes, you have a manager, you might have a publicist and yes, they work for you, but so much of your success relies on your relationships with people, your relationships with directors, with conductors, with casting agents, with colleagues, with people from the press, it, it's you is Matthew Epstein that actually said this, you are the CEO of your corporation. So you, your manager works for you slash with you, hopefully, but you are the CEO. Nobody cares about your career as much as you, right? So it's so important. So a, a lot of my, my success has come from this specifically just having relationships with people and and being myself enough so that they know me and they know they can trust me right and and just looking for opportunities and and sharing ideas and collaborating and there's so much opportunity there outside of the opera the theater hired me I'm going for my job and I, there's so much more 
that is possible. And I think, I think the more, the sooner young singers begin to develop the skill of entrepreneurship, the better off they will be in the end, because that's the only way to really, you can't, you can't control your career, but it's the only way to maximize success. Definitely. I also think that, I mean, always be kind to those around you. Um, I mean, and that's like, why do we have to remind ourselves of that? Right. Um, but, but let's, let's just talk for one second, a very, um, microscopic thing here. Um, but let's look back to our time at the university of Ottawa. Joyce and I went to the university of Ottawa together and, um, you know, who would have thought that now, um, you know, I'm editor in chief of Opera Canada, you know what I mean? You're a world class. I mean, I would have thought that, um, opera singer. I thought that at the time, I mean, very clear. Aww. Oh, that's sweet. Um, I, I didn't, but thank you. <laughs> So, I mean, look around our department, uh, Brian Waghorn, um, who's assistant conductor uh, coach at the Metropolitan Opera. There's Wallace Junta is, is you know, performing, um, yeah. you know, living in Vienna. Yeah, we have Miriam, Miriam Khalil as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Mireille Aslay. Like, um, I don't think Mireille went to... I don't think she went to RU. Yeah. Never she? Mind. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe <laughs> after me. She's one, though. <laughs> Well, so there you go. It's, we have something here. I, I mean, it's just interesting because you just don't know, I mean, where, what's going to happen. Your friend in, in your university days is going to end up in administration, be the right. general director of a big company right. or, or whatever. I mean, we're all, we're all in this together. And you no, know, I mean, there's definitely that point to be made, you, you know, but, but it's, it's, as a general rule, it's like kindness and authenticity and being yourself. Yeah. It's like a boomerang effect, you know, and it's not, we don't need to be kind. I mean, yes. Okay. Technically be kind to everybody because you never know who's going to be hiring you one day. That's what I was told. Right? right. But okay, great. Thank you. But what about just being kind because we're all humans trying to be happy on this planet and, you know, doing our best. Yeah. That's it also the point. Being kind and authentic and open-minded, all these things nurture your own soul as well. Like, I mean, they help others and they, they nurture your own beings. And so it's a win-win for all. So no, 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 exactly. If you're inauthentic, you're in a cage basically pretending to be somebody you're not to please other people. And with time that will backfire, I think on a personal level as a human, but also as an artist, if you're not authentic in your day-to-day -day life, how do you expect to be authentic on stage? Yeah. And this circles back also um, to the beginning of our conversation about the Fah system and the piece that's in our uh, spring issue where you know, we have had generations and generations of people forced to follow certain protocols that, you know, about how to be in mm. a business. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? They must sing these things. They must do these things. And, and then when people don't fit into that box, they haven't necessarily been able to have a career, right? Um, mm -hmm. if, if, if they aren't authentically sitting into in those in those places they don't get a career so it's really exciting now that people are opening their eyes and looking further and really looking for that authentic artist and opening the doors for these these people to have careers that you know they wouldn't necessarily have had in in day, the days of the closed closed minded yeah industry days yeah I think at the end of the day, when people spend their hard-earned money to go to the theater, they want to be moved. They want to be transported. They want to be inspired. And I believe that that can only happen when there's a human on stage truly sharing their, their humanity. Whatever way that looks or sounds, you know, yes, of course, we have to 
have the highest level possible. We have to sing the best way we possibly can on us on any given day. But without the heart and the authenticity, the audience will feel nothing. I mean, it's like I could have the most perfect technique and, you know, okay, great. But what am I trying to say? And I think people are, are starting to look for that. They can, cause they, like we said earlier, people can smell realness. They can smell confidence. And it's, it's a really exciting time in, in society and in our industry in general, because everybody is, the majority, I would say, are just breaking out of the boxes, I think.